Today's scripture reading comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Christ, Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. This is the word of God. Amen. So, you know, this Sunday, we're starting a new series through the book of Ephesians, and uh, my hope is maybe it'll be about around anywhere from like 10 to like 12, 14 weeks, depending on how, you know, God is, you know, adjusting the sermon and, you know, leading and uh, directing and things like that. So uh, I'm really excited to kind of share with you what God has to say through the book of Ephesians. But here's a quick fun fact about the book of Ephesians. Did you know that the book of Ephesians is the one church that Paul has that is actually the product of a revival? So Paul, he did many uh, effective ministry. Uh, some actually were not as effective. You know, his ministry in Athens, you know, uh, wasn't as fruitful. Uh, but some were like very fruitful. So, you know, it's kind of like you see different levels of fruitfulness in Paul's ministry. But out of all the ministries that Paul did, the most effective ministry was actually the ministry that happened at Ephesus. So, uh, in fact, uh, people say this was actually a revival. A, a God granted Paul revival, right? God granted the Ephesians church revival. It, uh, you know, so you can kind of read about that in Acts chapter 19. This was Paul's third missionary journey. And this revival actually started really small, where Paul goes into Ephesus and he sees these 12 guys. And as Paul's talking to them, and he's, you know, kind of like conversing with them, he said, hey, did you guys receive the Holy Spirit? And they're like, what's the Holy Spirit? And then, you know, Paul explains a little bit, lays hands on them. These people receive the Holy Spirit. And then afterwards, him, probably with this 12, begins to do their powerful ministry. And God comes with, like, powerful healing, powerful deliverance, powerful teaching, to the point where Luke says that the entire, everybody who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. And six years later, Paul writes this book of Ephesians. So Paul is writing this book of Ephesians to a church that actually experienced revival, okay? Now, um, what is a revival? You know, uh, maybe some of you never heard that word before or you've heard about it but never really understood what the definition of that is. But revival is when God sovereignly comes upon an individual, upon a people, upon a church, or upon a city, or even a nation, where God comes in a sovereign way to resuscitate that person, resuscitate that group, uh, you know, resuscitate the church back into his presence and to his reality once again. So this is where God usually is at the margin of our lives, but through revival, God becomes the center and forefront of our lives. So when usually revival hits a church, it restores the church back to a passionate, obedient, faith-filled relationship with Jesus. It usually causes mass conversions, and uh, it changes even the moral climate of the community that's around them. So in revival, people get saved, backsliding Christians are brought back, the sick are healed, people that are uh, demonized are demon casted out, uh, the church operates in the power of the Holy Spirit, while at the same time, they're battling the dark spiritual forces, uh, they're battling the world, and they're actually even battling some, you know, religious leaders that are in darkness. So that's basically what was going on. So, you know, like uh, if, if Jesus, you know, uh, his, Jesus' entire ministry was basically like a revival, and you see all that is happening, and then God graced Paul, God graced the Ephesians church to be able to experience that in this time, okay? So um, why do I share about this? Like, why, why are we going through the book of Ephesians? Well, my observation is that a lot of us are just going through the religious motions. A lot of us, uh, our hearts have become callous. A lot of us, our faith is nothing but a shell. 
when you look deep in our hearts, there's really nothing of the Spirit that's there. In fact, God doesn't seem like a powerful reality in our lives. Often, He is on the margins. So once again, we need to pray together as individuals and as a church, God, please bring revival. Amen? Right? Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I regularly pray for revival because I say, Lord, at least once in the lifetime of the Church of South Lanchino, may we experience revival in the power of Jesus' name. And another selfish prayer that I always pray is, and please, Lord, let it not be you know, let it not be before I die, right? Because, you know, I'll rejoice in heaven, but I will feel gypped. And, uh, you know, the next pastor is all enjoying it, you know, I'll be like, ha, 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 ha. Jesus, that's funny. (laughs) Right? And, you know, so uh, let's, let's pray that together. Let's pray that God would come in revival. You know, sometimes I pray this, and I don't even know what I'm asking for, But then when I read in the scriptures, I say, Lord, I would like something like that at least once. Uh, May I be able to experience it. So uh, this is why we're going through this book. This is why we're going through this, because I want to like like lay the foundations. I don't want to say prepare, but I want to lay the foundations so that our worldview is a worldview where, you know, uh, there's a yearning and a desire in our hearts for revival to come into our individual lives, into our family, into, you know, our church, into our city, and even into our nation, okay? And, you know, uh, if Ephesians is a, is a church that is the product of a revival, uh, why not study this book together as a church to see what God really has to say, okay? So, uh, you know, uh, in the book of Ephesians, it says that uh, revival starts with God. Revival starts with God's love. Revival starts with God's blessing, So, you know, when you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, all the way to verse 14, in the Greek, it's actually one long sentence. But the English, you know, to be able to understand it better, we divide it up into kind of like different, you know, verses and different sentences. But basically in this one long sentence, which, you know, some people call it a very, uh, like a Jewish poem, uh, Paul is recounting all the ways that God has blessed us so that in light of all the blessings that we have, that we should bless God that we should thank the Lord as God has blessed us. So in verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So when you kind of summarize this verse, it's basically saying, hey, let's all praise God. Let's all honor God because he has blessed us so much. And that's basically how the book of Ephesians starts. And then right after that, Paul says, Here's one way God's blessed us. Here's another way God's blessed us. And here's another way God blessed us. And he just keeps listing all of these things. And in my opinion, not in order, but actually in the order of priority. Like what's the most important blessing? Okay, what's the second most important blessing? What's the third most important blessing? And I'm going to kind of explain why. I I don't see it kind of like in like a a logical order, but in kind of like heart, a Paul's heart saying, hey, here's the greatest blessing that God has given. Okay? So the first blessing that God has given is this. Paul says that the greatest blessing, like in his mind at this time, is that God chose us. So brothers and sisters, I want you to know God, our sovereign Lord, has chosen you. Amen? Right? God has chosen you. So it says in verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in Love, okay? Now, uh, what does this mean? And why is this a blessing? Why is God choosing us such a blessing? Now, um, I don't know about you, but when I first heard this first, I was so distracted because, um, you know, something that was minimal became maximized and I lost the full blessing and the understanding of this first. So, you know, uh, I became a Christian in college and I remember after I, after I became a Christ, uh, Christian, uh, I was like, you know, uh, back then, I, I didn't know, but I was like so filled with the Spirit, you know. Uh, I was like so passionate for God, you know, like I was like zealous, you know. I was like one of those zealous people with no wisdom, you know. Like I just wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. So, you know, I'll go around and tell everybody about Jesus. And when they said no, I'm like, but you're going to go to hell, you know. Like, you know, like, like 
what, what, what's wrong with you? You know, so like, like, like no wisdom whatsoever, but I was like so passionate, you know. I like read the Bible, but like I don't understand what that it meant, but I just read it because like I was so passionate. I like sing and like, you know, I just wanted to like serve. I just wanted to do all these things. And then, you know, like the first couple of weeks after I became a Christian, this guy comes up to me. And then after he comes up to me, he's like, hey, man. And I was like, hey, what's up? He goes, I have a very important spiritual question to ask you. I said, what is that? He goes, are you Calvinist? Right? Are you Calvinist? I go, what's that? He goes, well, you know, you're either Calvinist or Armenian. And I literally thought, because, you know, I don't know anything, right? I thought, I'm like, I thought it was like people from Armenia, you know? And I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm Korean. Like, well, you, <laughs> like I, do you not see it? Right? He goes, no, 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 that's not what I mean. You know, he's like, you know, you know, he goes, does God choose you or do you choose God? And I was like, in it both? And he goes, no, 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 no. And then, you know, he was like, and then he was like explaining to me kind of the importance of this theology, how like this is the most important thing and how like, you know, the, the, you know, the bedrock of the Christian faith is on this. And then the verse he gave me was verse three. He goes, look at this. And then, you know, it's kind of like, you know, he pulls out a verse to say like, ha ha, you know, like one of those things, right? And he was like, God chooses us. And I was like, okay. And then, you know, he goes, look at verse four. He chose us. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. God chooses us. And that got me so distracted, right? Because brothers and sisters, that's not the main point of this verse. That's not the main point. Now, that could be a minor point with a whole bunch of questions, right? I'm not saying God doesn't choose, but what I'm saying is the main point of this verse is different, right? Uh, what do I mean? Okay, let's, let's look at this verse, okay? Let's, let's break it down. So this verse says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Okay, so uh, if we kind of broke this down, this is how we understand it. In love, God chose us. You guys see that, right? In love, God chose us. But there's a purpose. There's a purpose statement there. That, you see that word, that? So that. So why did he choose us? Out of love. Well, he chose us out of love so that we would be holy. See? But we don't understand this word holy. The, the common definition of the word holy is set apart. Set apart. So, you know, like uh, I, I was gave this illustration in the first service. If, you know, Robin was here and I wanted to make him holy or just set him apart, I would grab him and then I will place him here. It's just, just re like, you know, like moving that person. But set apart for what? So basically we're saying, hey, we don't want you to do that. Instead, we want you to do this. We're setting you apart. Well, the other answer is we're set apart so that what? That we'll be blameless. But before who? Before Jesus. So if I could kind of put it all together, God in his love chose us so that we would be set apart so that when we stand before him one day, we would be blameless. Does that make sense? Right? So uh, there's another verse in Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul is talking about marriages, where he's like, husbands, love your wives. You know, wives, submit to your husbands. It's going to be, uh, I'm so, uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, having incredible discussions and, you know, things like that in Ephesians 5 with you guys later on. But, um, you know, uh, but this is what Paul says. Paul says, husbands, love your wives so that, when they stand before Jesus one day, they would be holy and blameless. Paul literally uses the same words that he used in chapter 1. And usually in a book, when the writer uses the same word, it often has the same meaning because it comes from the same book that he wrote under one sitting. Okay? So uh, what do I mean? Like, so how do I, you know, what do I mean by that? So this verse in verse 4 is basically saying this. With love, God set us apart to help us, set us apart from darkness, brought us into the light so he can help us live this life so that when we stand before Jesus one day in heaven, that we would receive all the blessings that Jesus wants to give to us. That's basically what this verse is saying. Okay? And Paul says that this is the greatest blessing that we could have because he lists it first. Okay? He lists it first. So uh, God wants to help you to receive 
when you stand before him in heaven after you live this life, God wants to give to you all that he wants to give to you so that that's why he sent the Holy Spirit to help you. So um, if I could summarize it, Paul's greatest blessing that he's saying is this, God wants to help you be rich in heaven. Amen? God wants to help you be rich in heaven. Now, um, quick description, there's two judgments in the Bible. There's the great white throne judgment where, Paul, uh, where God separates those who believe God and those who don't believe God, the sheep and the goat. There's a second judgment called the judgment seat of Jesus where it's just for believers, where God rewards his people based on the life they lived before him while they were here on this earth. And when God rewards his people, right, uh, when, if you look at the New Testament, there's constant words of reward. When God rewards his people, if I could kind of summarize it, there's about 30 plus rewards that God gives for all the things that we do here on earth. But the most important thing are these things called the crowns. And there's five crowns that the Bible mentions. And these five crowns are the crown, the imperishable crown, which is talking about, you know, the crown of great sacrifice, the crown of rejoicing, which is a soul winning crown. It's an evangelism crown. It's a church planting crown. It's the crown of righteousness, which means you finish things well, you finish your life well. It's the crown of glory given to shepherds who shepherd the flock well. And it's the crown of life for those who are faithful in the midst of suffering. So somebody was like, you know, these crowns are like the heavenly infinity stones. You know, you got to like get it all, right? So this is what we sacrifice and toil and labor in this life to achieve so that we can stand before God and receive all the crowns and all the rewards that God wants to give to us. So brothers and sisters, let me say this. This is the teaching of the scriptures. This is the teaching. The full teaching of the scriptures is not, are you saved, not saved. That's the entrance way. That's the doorway. You are saved by your faith uh, in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you for the forgiveness of your sins. It is by grace. And if you have faith that you are a child of God, amen? But that is only the entrance. That doesn't make you blameless, right? That doesn't make you, you know, uh, God has made you holy, but he had, you know, like that doesn't make you blameless before Jesus, right? That's only the entrance way. Uh, the, the, the teaching of the, the Bible is that this life, right, is nothing but an appetizer. So earth is an appetizer, heaven is the main course, earth is the trailer, and heaven is the movie. In fact, uh, C.S. Lewis, this is probably my favorite quote by him, he says, all their life in this world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. He's talking about the life here on earth. Now they're in heaven. That's basically what he's saying. Now they are with God. And at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Right? That's heaven. So to prepare us for the real life that is to come, to prepare us for the real blessing, the real treasures, the real rewards, the, the, you know, the, the real thing, God chooses to set you apart and help you be blameless here on earth so that when you stand before him one day, you get to live the most amazing life that God wants to give you in heaven. Amen? That's what this verse is talking about. It's not, are you saved, not saved? It's more than that. It's, are you saved? Good. Now come here. Let me help you. Let me fill you with the Spirit so that you can live this life. So when you get into heaven, you'd be like, man, praise the Lord. I got to get everything that I wanted. Right? So, you know, uh, as, as we say this, right, you know, um, um, let me kind of uh, tell a little story to kind of illustrate it. This is not easy. This is not easy. This is why we often fail. So, uh, you know, uh, this is a long time ago. I, I don't remember how long it was. Maybe about 10 years ago? Or maybe longer. Yeah, maybe longer. But, uh, you know, my, my wife and I, uh, we decided to get life insurance. So, you know, uh, I didn't know when you get life insurance, you have to get a blood test because they want to see how healthy you are. So, you know, we won't get life insurance. So, you know, my wife got blood test. She's perfectly healthy. And then, you know, like uh, they gave her this like fat life insurance and I was like, oh, praise the Lord, you know. 
<laughs> and then, you know, uh, they took my blood, and then, you know, uh, they're like, oh, not good. So they cut my life insurance. Because, you know, they're like, this guy has a really high chance of dying, you know? So, uh, you know, uh, I was like, oh, I feel so bad for my, you know, if I die, my wife's still poor, but if she dies, I don't have to work anymore, you know? <laughs> You know, um, so you know they're like you know oh you know you're overweight you know you're pre -di you're pre diabetic you're almost gonna be diabetic you know uh, you know um, you're have high cholesterol like you know you're out of shape like and, and then you know like I was like what am I gonna do and then someone's like you need to exercise and then somebody heard that and then they're like oh you should do this thing called CrossFit have you guys ever heard of CrossFit right yeah. You know, and uh, I was like, okay, I'll check, I'll check it out. And this was like a long time ago, like when CrossFit was kind of like, you know, becoming famous. So I went to the first meeting, and uh, it was so nice. You know, the instructor was so nice, right? He was so nice. Uh, you know, his name was Justin. He's so nice, such a nice guy. You know, and then, you know, uh, my friend was like, oh, this is, you know, Pastor, this is Pastor Richard. Oh, hey, Pastor Richard, how are you? You know, nice to meet you. You know, we sit down. He goes, so what are your goals? Like, well, why are you here? And I said, well, I want to lose weight. You know, um, I want to, like, be less sick. You know, uh, you know I want to gain muscle, but I don't want to be too big. I want to be slim. You know, like, like, you know, he's like, oh, everybody says that, you know? And he goes, yeah, 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 just, you know, he goes, just come, you know, just come. And then he's like, hey, do you trust me? I was like, and then he showed me all these pictures of, like, transformation. He goes, do you? I go, oh, yeah, I guess I trust you. And then this is what he said to me. He goes, sometimes as we go through this journey together, right, you will hate me. <laughs> but... When you finish the journey, you will love me. I had no idea what he's talking about. Oh, he's such a nice guy. He's such a friendly dude. So, you know, he goes, you know, it's about this much. So I, I signed up for three months. And he's like, you know, I said, okay, hey, here you go. Let's do this. And then the next day I went, right? And I was like, oh, hey, Justin, right? And he's like, hey, Richard. <laughs> Not even pastor anymore, right? <laughs> and then, you know, he's like, okay, go over there. He's like, straight face. And the music starts playing, and then, you know, he's like, you know, all right, like 50 burpees, you know? And I'm like, what's a burpee? You know? He's like, you know. <laughs> right? Well, I'm doing burpees, and then, you know, it's like the craziest, like, it was so hard. It was so hard. I was dying. I thought I was going to have a heart attack and die there. And I remember, like, halfway through, I'm like, I can't do this. I really can't do this. And I went up to him, and I was like, just, I'm, I, I, I'm so sorry. I can't do this. And he said, you effing, you know, that, he started cussing me out. <laughs> Right? He's like, he goes, I don't give up. You know, like, you know. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, like. And then I really couldn't do it. I, I like, I, I'm like, I'm going to die. So I went to him and I, I, I I'm so sorry, right? I, he's like, you know, he goes, you know, I don't care. You know, you get back there. You do this, you know. He goes, oh, you hate me now. You, you know. And then, you know, uh, and then he was bugging me so much. I looked at him and I go, hey, do you know? And I was older than him too, right? And I was like, hey, do you know I'm a pastor? He goes, you ain't my pastor, right? And then. <laughs> And just, he rocked me. And then, you know, I, I, I literally dragged myself home, and I'm, like, lying on the sofa, and I couldn't move. I literally, I, I think I slept there the whole time. I woke up the next morning, and, like, you know, and then I dragged myself back, and then, you know, and I did that for three months, and he literally cussed at me for three months, right? And it started to change. I started to lose weight, I, I, I became from almost diabetic to just, you know, kind of pre-diabetic, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm still pre-diabetic, but, you know, like, you know, my cholesterol went down. Like, I got a little bit healthier. And then, you know, after three months, you know, they have, we have like three-month meetings, you know, like kind of check-ins. So, you know, I, I sat with him, and he's like, hey, you know, nice again, right? It's like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, right? You know? you know, he goes, Pastor Richard, oh, you know, how are you doing? I was like, who are you, <laughs> right? <laughs> And he goes, hey, look at you. Wow, your results are so good. You know, I'm so proud of you. You're doing such a good job. And then, you know, he's like, hey, but, you know, hey, but, you know, sometimes you hate me, but do you love me now? And I'm like, you know, actually, I, I do. I actually love you. So I did it for eight months. Yeah. So, you know, all those people that think I'm just a big nerd that re reads book all day, right? Hey, 15 years ago, I did CrossFit, man, okay? <laughs> I want you to know, okay? Yeah, what do I do now? I try to walk. <laughs> right? Why do I say this? Because God, you know, okay, let me say this. I want you to have an image of God, all right? God is your loving shepherd. He is your loving father, but God is also your CrossFit instructor, okay? You know why? Because he wants you 
to be the most healthiest, the most alive, the most blessed, the most rewarded when you finally enter through the doors of heaven. In fact, he doesn't want you to enter through the doors of heaven sick or with any fat on you. Amen? You're like, amen. <laughs> right? You know, um, that's why it's so hard. That's why it's so hard. You know? Um, I remember, you know, somebody said a good pastor, a good pastor is someone, you know, a good pastor is not someone who's nice and kind. A good pastor is not someone who like, you know, like good shepherd, good speaker, you know, a good shepherd, a good pa- you know, all those things are important, right? Good shepherd, you know, a good pastor is not, you know, someone who organizes well, who leads well. You, you know what a good pastor is? Someone said this, a good pastor is who make their people rich in heaven. That's a good pastor. It's someone who makes their people rich in heaven. And I want to be a good pastor. God loves you. But selfishly, I care deeply about each and every one of you. You know why? Because pastors, we're like heavenly wealth managers. Right? For every reward you get, I get a percentage. (laughs) Right? And some of you, you know, some of you, right, um, your stock, you know, my stock is so good. Some of you guys, like, you know, you guys are so good, right? You, you know, you guys are performing so well. Others of you, right, I'm so tempted to sell. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm just joking. You know I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm really joking. <laughs> right? I'm joking. Right? But I want you to know, that's what this verse means. God chose you, set you apart, sent the Holy Spirit to you to help you be blameless here on earth so that when you stand before Jesus one day, you can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, and receive everything that God wants to give to you. Amen? Yeah. But you have to join him. Because God doesn't force people. The Holy Spirit is gentle. The Holy Spirit invites. The Holy Spirit doesn't force. Right? So you got to join him. And I know it's painful now, but you'll love him so much that he was nudging on your heart to keep pursuing after the treasures of heaven. Second, God chose us. Second, God adopted us. God adopted us. So this is where I say um, it's not in the order of salvation because when you look at the proper order of salvation, God chooses and then he forgives and then he adopts. But when you look at Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says God chooses, he adopts, and he forgives, right? He kind of like mixes the order a little bit. So it seems like in Paul's heart that he's kind of talking about the greatness of the blessings, like the priority of the blessings. And, you know, uh, that makes a lot of sense, you know? Like, man, you know, if, if our real life is in heaven and the greatest blessing that God wants to give us is there, then he will help us right now. But the second great blessing is God adopted us. So it says, verse 5, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. So once again, let's summarize this. God, out of the kind intention of his will, the kindness of his heart, went beyond forgiveness to adopt us as his children. Right? So God in our relationship with him, went from judge to father. Okay? Now, that's different because a judge forgives, right? Judge acquits. Fathers, they give. Okay? A judge acquits. Fathers, they do many things, but the primary thing the Bible says that fathers do is that they give. In fact, That's what Paul says in verse 6. He says, 
God is our father, and then he says, he gives. And he doesn't just give, he gives lavishly. So verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Grace is just gifts. To the praise of the glory of all the gifts that he wants to give you. Charis, this great Greek word, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So if I could kind of summarize this, God becomes our father so that he could freely give glory of all the gifts that he wants to give us freely bestowed upon us so that one day we will praise him for it. Isn't that amazing? So, so w- w- what do fathers do? They give. That's their heart. A, a good father's heart is to give to their children. So brothers and sisters, here's my question. What is the best gift? What is the best gift a good, loving, wise father wants to give to their children? What is the best gift? And, you know, some of us, you know, maybe we won't say this, but the way we act, we literally think the best gift that we can give to our children is, like, give them a lot of money, right? You know, uh, give them all our wealth. You know, know, give them them our, you know, monetary, you know, inheritance. You know, uh, give give them all the land that we possess. But, brothers and sisters, let me say this, okay? Did you know that if the main thing you give them is money, wealth, and land, By the second generation, 70% of those who have received that inheritance will lose it. And did you know, by the third generation, 90% of those who have received that inheritance will lose it. So pretty much, this is what the book of Ecclesiastes says, everything you worked hard for, everything you slaved over to break your back so that you can give to your family, in the third generation, it will be all gone. I almost said in Jesus' name, but that's not the case. Right? Right? It'll be all gone. So why are you working so dang hard, breaking your back to give them something that they cannot hold on to? Right? So some parents, understanding this, uh, went the other way. So Warren Buffett, he's like, I'm not going to give my children anything. You know, Sting. uh, You know, somebody was like, who's Sting? He's he's not a wrestler. (laughs) It's Stinger, right? Sting decided, I'm not going to give anything to my children. Why? Because he's like, they're going to lose it anyway. They're not mature enough to handle it. So if you really want your children to succeed, like if you really want your children to do well in life, what do you give them? You give them your wisdom. You give them your learning. You give them your experience. You give them your skill. You give them your character. You give them your disposition. What the Bible says is this. All of these things are summarized in one word. You give them your spirit. You give them your spirit. If you're a good, loving, wise father, you want your children to succeed. Yes, you know, land, wealth, money, I'm not saying it's bad, but that's minimal. What's maximal so that they could hold on to all that is that you give them your spirit, right? So that's the heart of a loving father. Now, let's take this back to God. God is the greatest father of all. Can I get amen on that? Right? God is the greatest father of all. There is no father that is greater than God. God even looks at good fathers and he says, you are evil, right? Even good, evil, earthly fathers give good things to their children. He says, I am so much better than that. So God, who really wants his children to succeed in this life and in the life to come, God, who loves his children, wants to give the greatest gift to his children, What will God give? Will God give land? Will God give riches? Will God give wealth? You know, will God give those things? Yes, maybe God will, but the most important thing that God wants to give is his spirit to you. God wants to give his spirit to you. Therefore, in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, it says this, God, being a loving father, wants to give the best gift that he can to us. If you then, being evil, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's the best gift the the heavenly father wants to give to you. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's his spirit, his wisdom, his disposition, his character, his skills, you know, his experience poured out upon you so that as he succeeded, you would succeed too. Right? 
That's basically what God wants to give. Therefore, when Jesus, God's son, came here on earth and he walked this earth, God looked at Jesus and said, you are my son. I love you so much. I want you to live the most successful human life that you could ever live here on earth. And therefore, to help you, I'm going to fill you with the Holy Spirit. You guys see that? Jesus was the most successful human being to have ever lived here on earth, although he was God. And the only way he could have done that was because God, his father, gave the Holy Spirit to him so that he could live a successful life. Okay? That's what I'm talking about here. Okay? That's what we need to focus on. But here's our problem. We want everything but the Holy Spirit. We want everything from God but the Holy Spirit. Right? And even like, you know, um, you know parents, I know you love your children. I love my children too. But the way we love our children is kind of off sometimes for some of us. Okay? You know why? Because I think we get the concept. Right? Because, you know, like, uh, you know, some of us, you know, uh, we want our kids to succeed. And I, I, want, I, want, I want your kid to succeed. I want, my, I want everybody to succeed, okay? So, you know, we, we, you know, we want our kids to succeed. So we spend all this time and money and sacrifice and energy, right? And then, you know, so, so they can receive, you know, they go to a piano and tutor and, like, football coach and, you know, all that stuff, right? And, and the reason why we do this is because, you know, we want them to have the spirit of the piano teacher, right? You know, we want them to have the spirit of the tutor. We want them to have the spirit of the football coach, right? And, you know, like, you know, th that's why we do all this. You know, I, I, I was the same way you know like my kids like for 16 14 15 years of their life like you know we sent them to piano like once a week twice a week right and, and i remember i told my wife i go you know maybe we shouldn't do this you know and like no we need the spirit of this piano teacher in our kids right you know so we put the spirit of the piano teacher in our kids now that they stop they never play piano right <laughs> and i remember i was thinking to myself we could have bought a car with all this money that we put into piano right Right? And, and then we do this, and here's the problem, brothers and sisters. You know, you know, send them to piano, send them to tutoring, like, you know, send them to sports so they receive the spirit of these coaches. And I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying they're bad. They might be good, but here's the thing. Do you ever sacrifice your money, time, energy, and effort so that they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit? Right? You know? Like, piano's good. Piano's good. I wish I learned piano. Right? Tutoring's good. Tutoring's really good. Sports is good. I love sports. Right? I have fond memories of sports. I'm not saying it's that, but I'm talking about the priority because some of the kids that you have, they're filled with the spirit of sports. They're filled with the spirit of music. They're filled with the spirit of education. But I guarantee you, honestly, they are not filled with the spirit. And that's a problem. Why? Because although we have that heart, that good intention for our children to succeed, we are not doing according to the ways of the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, especially parents, I encourage you, as you spend time and effort and energy into all these things, good things, by the way, I'm not saying it's bad, it's good things, may you spend even more time, effort, and energy into filling your children with the Spirit of God in Jesus' name. Amen? Yeah. And that's you, that's you, that's your job as a parent. Right? Praying with your children, praying for your children, bringing them to church, right? Uh, you know, letting them know how much you love Jesus. Right? Letting them know how important Jesus is in your life. Right? And if our children need the Spirit of God most of all, don't you need the Spirit of God most of all? Right? Yeah. You know why God gives you the Holy you know, Spirit? <laughs> you know, someone's like, you know, why does God give us the Holy Spirit? And then, you know, somebody was like tongue-in-cheek, you know, oh, so we speak in tongue, fall down and shake, and, you know, bark like dogs. No. No. You know why God gave you the Holy Spirit? So you could succeed in life. So you could succeed in life. Do you believe Jesus was the most successful person that has ever lived here on earth? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't you want to be successful here in this life? Well, God wants to help you. As a father, he wants to fill you with his spirit so that you may succeed in this world that he created. Isn't that amazing? But you have to join him. You have to join him. You know, If you say no, you can always say no, but then it hurts you. Um, what else does the father want to give to us? Right? Why is this such a blessing, you know, Ephesians? Uh, 
So uh, let me kind of, you know, uh, talk about it in a different way. So um, in, in this world, I'm pretty sure you guys know this, especially kind of like a little bit with the younger generation. Um, there's a lot of victim mentality that's going on. Okay? Like a lot of victim mentality. And uh, what's victim mentality? Okay? Uh, I'll kind of describe it. You know, it's a little bit more than this, but uh, it, it's often rooted in shame. Uh, people with victim mentality are very apathetic. You know, they're like lazy, unmotivated, don't really want to do anything. You know, uh, victim mentality. You guys heard of quiet quitting that's happening in China? It's rooted in victim mentality. Right? Um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anger. Uh, people who struggle with victim mentality, they believe in their hearts like, oh, I'm weak. I'm sinful, life is unfair, I'm helpless, you know, uh, life is against me, this world is rigged to get me. So, you know, unconsciously they're crying out, you better help me. Uh, people with victim mentality, they have no boundaries. They, they have no personal responsibility. So, you know, uh, one of the ways is you, you point out something, you know, that's, that's, that's wrong, right? Like, like not even improvement, but wrong, like sinful. You know, you, you, you point that out, and then rather than taking responsibility, they, they blame you by majoring on the minor and minoring on the major. So, you know, like, for example, like, you know, hey, what you did was sin. Oh, uh, yeah, I know, I know what I did was sin, but why are you so mean? Why are you so not nice? Why are you so not gentle? I can't listen to you. You know what? I'm going to quit. But what you did was sin. I know it was sin, but you are not nice. <laughs> Okay, I'll be nicer, but don't you know, don't talk to me about my sin. Tell me about your niceness. I, by the way, that, that has happened to me. I'm, I'm just recreating that. <laughs> and this is where my face is like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm apologizing. That's victim mentality. Right? Uh, victim, victims are often narcissistic. And unfortunately, I think they're demonized. How do they get this way? How does a person get this way? Right? I, I, I don't think you're born with this, by the way. How does a person become a victim? Two things. They have a negative self-view. They have a very negative self-view. And they have a very negative view of the world. So negative self-view, I'm weak, I'm poor, I'm not that great, I'm broken. Negative view of the world, life is unfair, people are out, get, out to get me, this life is rigged against me. So how do you change victim mentality? Okay, let me say this, you don't change victim mentality by telling them they're a victim. Because they get even worse. Right, you know, I remember one time lovingly, I was like, hey, don't you think it's a little bit of a victim? And it was over. I frowned, like, don't you call me, you know, like, I'm like, okay, uh, okay. Thank you, nice meeting you. <laughs> right? How do we change this? God has to go from judge to father. God has to go from judge to father. You see, God being our father is basically another way of saying we need to have a better, healthy self-image. You know the song we sang? I am no longer a slave to fear. I am. Actually, yeah, I, I hate doing this, but let's all do it together. Right? Yeah, one of my pet peeves is like, turn to your neighbor and say this. <laughs> yeah, most of the time I don't do it. <laughs> if I'm sitting there, Pastor, like, turn to your neighbor, I'm like. <laughs> you know? Uh, but let's all say it, okay? I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am what? child of God. You know, some doctrines, some theologies, they constantly tell you you're a sinner. They constantly tell you how depraved you are. Totally. Right? They keep telling you that you were born in sin, that you struggle with sin. It's all about sin. They're destroying your self-image. So what do you do? You become a victim. 
because you have a negative self-view, right? Brothers and sisters, for every one look at sin, you need to take seven looks at the great love of God in your life, amen? You know, my, my professor said this. He said, guys, every time you walk outside, you look up into the sky, I want you to imagine God smiling at you. Right? Whether you had a good day or a bad day, God is smiling at you. Brothers and sisters, God hates wickedness, but God is so compassionate to weakness. He is so compassionate to weakness. God hates wickedness but he is so compassionate to weakness. And do you receive that compassion, especially in your weakness? You see, we need to, the fatherhood of God, judges can't do that. Only fathers can do that. Fathers create a healthy image of ourselves. And also, God being a father teaches us how to have a healthy image of this world. You see, people, the core struggle of a person struggling with victim mentality is this. They think, they think I, I suck. I'm messed up. I'm sinful. I'm broken. Like, I'm helpless. And the world sucks. The, you know, the world is unfair. You know, the world is out to get me. And, and you know, uh, the world is rigged against me. Right? And, and you see this in social media, especially with young people. They're complaining about the world. They're complaining about themselves. And then so they fall into this victim mentality. But brothers and sisters, if you are a child of God and you believe in what the Bible says, and if you believe in the truth of Scripture, let me say this, right? You are not a sinner and you are a child of God. You are beloved. God is not angry with you unless you're practicing wickedness. And you, God is so compassionate to you in your weakness. Can I get an amen on that? A- amen on that? Right? And at the same time, brothers and sisters, if you are a child of God, the world is not unfair. The world is not rigged against you. In fact, the Bible says this, the world, for all of its brokenness, all of its sin, all of the demonic attacks, the world, if you are a child of God, is actually rigged in your favor. Right? You know why? Because in this broken world, God is working so dang hard to turn everything for good in your favor. Right? The world is not against you. The world is for you because of the sovereign and loving hands of God. So if you are a child of God, you are so loved by God, you are so treasured by God, and this world that you lived in, live in is rigged with favor and blessing and power and goodness for a child of God. God is working for those who follow him. This world is rigged in their favor, right? Therefore, as a beloved child of God, God is working for our good no matter what our circumstances are. Therefore, for Romans 8 says this, we are not victims, but we are more than conquerors. We are victors in Jesus' name. You believe that, you no longer struggle with victim mentality. And no matter how hard your life is, you will always overcome and defeat any forces of darkness and live the life that God has called you to live. So I say this to young people. Get rid of your victim mentality. Why? Because God is, right? Right? for you. Okay? Now let me correct this cuz my senior pastor says God is never for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Okay. God is for you not against you. Romans 8. But you are always for God. Right? Joshua. You know? Joshua said to the captain of the Lord of hosts, are you for us against us? The captain of the Lord of, Lord of hosts says, I am for neither, I am for me. Right? Um, so, my youngest daughter, she's, she's, she's so funny. Uh, people think she's the serious one, but she's, she's very funny. And please, don't tell her I talked about her. <laughs> because... She comes right to me and goes, what'd you say about me? <laughs> you know, um, you know she, uh, one time she was like, man, you know, uh, school's so hard, life's so hard, you know, uh, friendship's so hard, you know. Um, you know, she's like, man, you know, like, like oh, is there anything? She goes, no, it's so hard, everything's so hard. And then I'm like, victim, victim, victim. You know, like, so I'm about to go into, like, my pastor mode. I, <clears throat> you know, you know the Bible says. <laughs> Right? But then this is where she stopped me. 
She goes like, yeah, you know, me and my friend, you know, saying life is hard, you know, no one understands us, it's unfair, you know, like, you know, things are difficult, you know, like, uh, you know, we're struggling, this and that. But she looked at me, she goes, but dad? And I was like, what? But she said, me and my friend, we always decided we have the upper hand. We always have the upper hand. So when me and my friend, you know, we're having a hard time, we look at each other, and even if we throw across the school, we go like this. <laughs> right? And that's our way of saying, no matter what, you know, people try to put us down, we got the upper hand. Right? And I was like, wow. Wow. And I said, Ellie, you are so right. I said, no matter what happens into your life because God is with you, you always have the upper hand. And sometimes when I see her complaining, I just want to be like. <laughs> right? But you got the upper hand. Right? So brothers and sisters, I know your life is hard for some of you. I know circumstances must be un unimaginable for some of you. I know that seasons are very difficult. But I want you to know because God is with you, you always have the upper hand. Pastor Keith said this. He said uh, this year, he wants our, the theme of our churches to be absolute hope. Absolute hope. Right? He goes, you know, hey, let's have absolute hope. Right? Not just hope, but absolute hope. You guys know what absolute hope is? No matter what, we hope. And may that be the posture of your hearts, absolute hope, right? Why? Because you are a child of God. Amen? Yeah, let's pray.